Uh, okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum dan uh, salam sejahtera for Associate Professor Dr. Kenneth Francis, Deputy Director Center for E-Learning UMS uh, yang berusaha Cik Nora, Nora Zaliza dan uh, semua tenaga pengajar di PPIB. Sebelum roadshow bermula, saya ingin menjemput timbalan dekan akademik dan antarabangsa PPIB untuk memberikan ucapan alu-aluan. Dipersilakan. Terima kasih kepada Puan Erna Tika selaku pengerusi majlis dalam program roadshow kita pada petang ini. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Pertama sekali, saya ingin mengucapkan selamat datang kepada Dr. Kenneth dan Timbalan Pengarah Pusat Ikon Pelajaran UMS dengan rombongannya, eh, rombongan macam datang ke sini aja kan, dengan inilah dengan dengan uh, staff-staff dari uh, Pusat Ikon Pelajaran UMS yaitu Cik Nora Zaliza dan Encik Zulfadli. Jadi uh, bagi pihak PPIB, saya ingin mengucapkan uh, dan terima kasih lah atas inisiatif daripada Pusat Ikon Pelajaran untuk mengadakan uh, roadshow Uh, proses uh, e-pembelajaran pada petang ini dan bagi kami di BPIB program ini sebenarnya adalah satu program yang sangat penting dalam memberikan maklumat terkini kepada uh, semua staf BPIB berkenaan dengan apa-apa uh, uh, perancangan ataupun apa-apa perubahan yang <coughs> dibuat oleh pusat e-pembelajaran dan maklumat terkini ini sangat penting apatah lagi berkenaan dengan kaedah-kaedah dalam pelaksanaan e-learning dalam kursus-kursus PPIB. Dan uh, untuk makluman juga lah daripada, uh, kepada uh, Pusat Ikon Pembelajaran, Alhamdulillah lah dengan uh, adanya usaha daripada Jawatan Kuasa e-learning PPIB uh, dengan uh, kerjasama daripada semua staff ataupun semua tenaga pengajar PPIB, uh, eh, pencapaian e-learning bagi uh, PPIB khususnya untuk kursus-kursus uh, PPIB yang blended learning Sejak tahun 2020, 2021 dan diharapkan akan berterusanlah PPIB telah mencapai KPI 100% kursus PPIB blended learning. Jadi saya tidak ingin berucap panjang lah sebab saya nak memberikan laluan ataupun fokus kepada taklimat ataupun dalam apa ni daripada pihak Pusat Ibu Pembelajaran lah berkenaan dengan roadshow pada hari ini. Jadi sekali lagi saya ucapkan terima kasih atas uh, kehadiran, atas uh, taklimat ataupun atas roadshow yang dianjurkan oleh pihak uh, Pusat Ibu Pembelajaran. Itu saja dari saya. Terima kasih. Uh, terima kasih diucapkan. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome Dr. Ken. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, is it Miss Erna or Puan Erna? Uh, Puan Erna. Okay. Thank you very much. Terima kasih Puan Erna. Thank you very much. Terima kasih to Dr. Siti Aida. Thank you very much for inviting uh, the Center for E-Learning to be here today with you all. And I'm here to uh, basically uh, uh, receive feedback from you and update you regarding the system. So a very good afternoon to all the respected professors. I can see the Dean is here, Dr. Uh, Professor Lion Yumeng. Uh, good afternoon to you, sir. Uh, and to the respected lecturers, associate professors, doctors, uh, Madam and everyone present here today. Thank you very much for inviting the Center for e-learning here today. I'm sorry I have to wear my mask. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, I will start sharing my screen first and I will uh, show you some of the things which we'll be covering today. Okay, so I will just look at these screens. I'm, gonna start, I'm looking at some. So. Okay, so that's the screen I'm sharing. Can you see the screen, uh, Puan Arna? Can yes. you see my screen? Okay. okay, because sometimes it hangs. So in today's uh, Taklimat, we basically used to have this roadshow when we used to come to each and every faculty. I think we just came to PPIB before the pandemic with our team, and then we used to address certain issues related to the system. Uh, so that's the uh, learning management system. Now with PPIB, there's a unique uh, th uh, thing which happens is that uh, many of us are actually uh, lecturers and some of us are tutors. Okay, now sometimes tutors used to face the problem of you know, enrolling into the system and having full system access. Are you still facing that problem? That's what I want to ask at the first at the beginning of this session. 
are the tutors facing any problem with the system access? And I can give you the solution for that. Any uh, input from the tutors if you are present here today? So if you have a problem, I'll, t I'll explain to you basically what happens is that uh, if you are not having a registered UMS email ID, you will have a problem when it comes to registering into the learning management system because that is linked to the UMS email ID. So if you need a, a link to that, I mean, if you need to log into the system, register and so on and so forth, there's a solution for that. So Nora can give you the email in the chat window and that's the contact for you in case you have a problem with registering and if you're a tutor and a non-UMS permanent staff. Okay, so that's the solution for you. So what are we going to focus on today? Nora, can you please share the link in the chat window? The PHP, the sorry, the, the LMS uh, management admin link. So today I'm going to cover some of the topics which are related to the e-learning, I'm not projecting a screen because with WebEx, if you try to do a slideshow, it will tend to hang. This is another problem which we face with the system when we transition from Google Meet to WebEx. Okay, so I prefer to use PDF. That's a solution which I would recommend to all of you. So today we are going to learn about the UMS LMS itself. Many of you are already experienced with the system, but I will guide you step by step through the various features so that you can uh, keep up the good work and still achieve the 100% which you achieve then we look at the criteria for audit. I will share the link with you to the audit. Uh, there's a there's a, actually a PHP server, which is a live server for audit. So Nora will share that link with you in the chat window. I will tell you something about OER repository. Dawn Eugenia is currently uh, unwell, so she cannot attend, but uh, she is in charge of the OER and the um, MOCs. Okay, so she's the coordinator for OER and MOC. So, uh, any further information can be obtained from her or from me as well. So these are the things which we uh, look for in the course when we commence because next week we are going to start teaching. So we have to look at certain elements of the course. The most common thing which lecturers will try to do or academicians will try to do is to restore the old course. Okay. Are all of you aware of the process of uh, backup and restore? because this will save you a lot of time when you commence your course. So if you're not aware of this process of backup and restore, I will basically guide you through that process and we will show you how to restore a course. Then the next one is to registering your students. So there are multiple modes to register your students. One is the automated registration, but with PPIB again, th th it's unique because uh, there, are, there are multiple um, uh, streams or multiple groups of students join the stu join the courses from different faculties. So again, registering the students becomes a challenge. So one of the ways in which you prevent overlapping uh, registration is by using the password and the key. So the students can register using a specific key so that you don't have the, the problem of deregistering students before, uh, again. Because one of the, uh, the issues with the system is that once a student registers into the system and commences using it, if he or she deregisters, all the data, the metadata, the, the associated with the student will be lost. So when he or she deregisters, there won't be a backup of that data file. So it's bad for the student as well as for us because the course file will not be complete. But that's how we show you how to do this registration. The other one is the group assignments. So there are certain features which have been added into the system, which allow the students to choose their own group. So they can make their own group amongst themselves. And of course, under the control of the lecturers, then the course synopsis, the course content, you're all familiar with the uh, assignments and some features I'm going to cover are grading. So that's how to create a grade book and download a grade book in the system. The quiz, if you all are interested in the quiz, and uh, based on your feedback, I will cover the quiz and question bank. Then we have the how to link content from OER. Now, the, the, the good thing about UMS is we have an open educational resources repository. So this is a reference base for all your lectures. For instance, if you have 14 lectures uh, covered over 14 weeks, all you need to do is to upload 14 lectures notes in PDF format into an OER. And then you just backlink it into your system. There's no need to upload it repeatedly for each semester. So that will save you a lot of time. 
Now, the other one is a communication system. So the Moodle uh, learning management system, which we have in UMS has a chat facility now. This chat window has been recently introduced and we also can communicate using the Moodle mobile. Okay, Moodle mobile is an app. So you can, if you need to install it in your smartphone, you can install the Moodle mobile app and it works just as well as smart UMS. Okay, so that's what we have. I'll show you how to add some of forums and discussions and maybe even the wiki. These are some features in the system. So generally when we introduce you to the smart UMS uh, learning management system, we go into the one, seven, three, and two. That's the synopsis, the course contents, seven course contents, then the three uh, feedbacks and forums or communications via chat, and then we have the two assignments. So that's the basic criteria for audit. But having said that, that is not the complete blended learning uh, ecosystem. In a blended learning ecosystem, there's a significant amount of interaction in the course. And this is achieved by using the chat and other elements of the LMS. Okay, and there is another element which is very good feature when you have a very large class, which is the analysis of student learning behavior. Now, some of you who attended the earlier talk may be aware of the learning analytics in the system. You can track student uh, performance in the system by using analytics. So in addition to their grades, you also have another parameter, which is the performance in terms of activity in the class. And this is done using learning analytics. So LMS is powerful because it can capture these analytics. Then we have the OER. I will briefly introduce you to the OER. So during the roadshow, we generally request the lecturers to register in the OER system because we will assist you with the process of registration. Unlike the other uh, platforms in UMS such as SMP, SMPPI and so on and so forth, the OER repository is a separate platform. It has its own uh, access password and you will have to uh, register for it separately. Okay, so it will help you in that process of registration. Then I will cover something very briefly about the MOCs. Now, for those of you who are interested in developing your MOCs, we currently have a MOC platform, which is inside the Smart P3. And we are currently having about six lecturers who have uh, requested courses and who are in the process of reviewing their MOCs. Now, an MOC is actually a smaller component of a larger course. You can see it, you can, uh, for example, you have your 14 week course, uh, MOC may be four or five weeks of that course, which will cover only one learning outcome, one CLO, for instance, CLO. So you have a process. So when we want to create an MOC, it's just like any other ordinary uh, course, which we create in the learning management system. We have to go through a process of creating the table four for that. So the table four in the case of MOOCs is not so advanced. It is a basic table, which covers just the content and the uh, delivery methods and the CLOs it achieves. So we have a course template. For those of you who are interested in uh, creating a MOOC, we can share this course template with you. So usually you have a course template, you create the course template, which is similar to table four, but this is just four lectures. Then you have uh, reviewers for that course template because we have to ensure you have quality. Review process is completed and the reviewer recommend changes, you improve and then you deploy it at the website. So this is the overall process of the MOC, which can be assisted. We assisted, we generally assist you with that process. So it's um, uh, Madam Eugenia and myself who will assist you with MOOC uh, development, design and development. Okay, so that's what we'll be covering today. So to begin with, I'm going to uh, open up a course windows. Okay. So this is actually a link I'm going to share with you in the chat window. Okay. So I'm going to open up a chat window and I'm going to share a link with you. I've shared it earlier, but those of you who, who logged in uh, later on may not have access to this chat, uh, to this link. So please go to the link in the chat window and you can enroll for the course. Click on the link and enroll. Now this course will be, uh, given to all of you, you can use this template for yourselves and uh, you you can basically uh, go through what we covered today, okay, in, with, in conjunction with the recording. So I've shared the link with you and uh, this is the way you register for this particular course. 
And I'm going through this step by step because this is generally the procedure which we follow through with all our students. So you share the link with them and they can register for the course. Okay. So uh, please click on the link and register for the course. Now, as you register, can, can you see my mouse moving? I'm going to click on the course and you can see the people in this course. Okay. So, okay. So that's, you can see there's a, a large number of people here, uh, our academic staff who have registered for the course. Okay. So that's the first part, which is the registration part. Now comes the next part, which is the registering students from multiple programs. Okay. Now you have PPIB. We have, we, they all, we always have this discussion with, uh, one Eugenia last time, and then she mentions about multiple students from multiple programs registering, okay, because language courses are shared across different faculties. So, what you can do in this is to set up a password, okay, users, and then you go to the enrollment methods here, okay. I, I'm just going to zoom on it so you can see it. Then I zoom out after I finish. So, you have users here at the side of your block, and if you can't see this block, you just view the you just say view block. Okay. So that's a block. So you have the users here and you have enroll users here and then you click on enrollment methods. Okay. So I'm going to zoom out again. Okay. And then under this enrollment methods, I go down and I do self enrollment. Okay. Now with this self enrollment, I give the student the choice to enroll for this particular course. So I don't automatically enroll them. I give them the choice. So this is good when you have students from multiple uh, faculties joining your course. So in order to uh, do this self enrollment, we have to create an instance. An instance is actually like a key for that course. Okay. So I'm going to give this, which you'll call, for example, course A, B, A, B, C, D, enroll. Okay. I call it. So you can, you can uh, put in your name here, ABC. Okay. One, two, three. So this ABC one, two, three replace with your course name, or you can put your course code and then enroll. Okay. So that gives the students a uh, search. So if they search for that course, this hashtag, they will find it in the system. So allow existing enrollments is usually yes. Now this button, right? If I said to no now at this point in time, all of you who have enrolled for the course may be asked to re-enroll. Okay, so generally we, uh, so before you create this self-enrollment key, you need to have no students in your course, just you, your co-lecturer, and then you're teaching that course. So you say, now I'm going to say yes, but who else it will exclude everyone else from the course. And then you allow new enrollments, yes. And this is what you need to give to the students here. So this one you can share via a, how do you, you can share it on Moodle mobile or you can share it to the respective coordinator. So you'll have an enrollment key, which is a, basically a password, which you auto generate. So I just create one, one, two, three, four. Okay. So I have enrollment key. Okay. So this is the enrollment key. Now, what is going to happen is that from now on, but before I did this particular setup, you could enroll automatically, but from now onwards, whoever wants to enroll will have to key in this ABCD one, two, three, four. I'm going to share it in the chat window. So anyone who comes in later won't have a problem with enrollment. So Nora can copy and paste. Okay. That's so it's going to go into. So anyone who joins after this, you can use the enrollment key. So there's a group enrollment key and so on and so forth. And you have an enrollment duration, which you don't generally uh, touch. And this one is something which you need to set or else students will enroll beyond the first week. Okay. So if you don't want students to enroll beyond it, you can enable it. Okay. So generally enrollment only from start date and you can enable it on a stop, stop date. So after that, the students cannot enroll. Now this may be a good way to manage your course so that the students don't enroll later on. However, if your course is going to permit students to enroll later on, I mean, after that set date, then you have to disable this. Okay. So just make sure that these settings are done properly because this is a good management practice. Okay. Then unenroll and this one is never or else you will lose your data. As I said earlier, and you have a maximum enrolled users. So suppose your course capacity is for instance, is 150. You can set it. If not, you leave it open and then you have to give a custom enroll uh, message. So here you can welcome the students to the course 
and you can add a YouTube video if you want to, a link to a YouTube video. Okay, I'm going to give you an alternative uh, platform which is called Microsoft Stream later on. I will show you how to set up your Microsoft Stream account, but for now we use, you can have a YouTube video uh, or a Vimeo or a TikTok and then you just add method. Okay, now what's going to happen is that we have 24 participants in the course. This is all our respective lecturers and we have the uh, ones who will register after this, who will have to go through the process of keying in that password. So this ABCD1234, okay, so that's the, now you have set up your course. Okay. Now, some of us may want to have groups, some of us may not want to have groups. So usually the next step in a blended learning setup, if you want to set up groups, is to set up your group. Okay, so. so again, I zoom in, sorry about this because you're on a small screen, so I have to zoom in and zoom out. So you have the groups, okay? And we click on groups. Okay, now, now the system allows you multiple options and it also allows you students to make their choice. Okay, so, so we are, we, okay, let's look at the first situation where I don't really uh, mind who's in which group, I just want to select a random group. So in this way, I click on this auto create groups. So auto create groups automatically. So naming scheme group at the rate of, for example, as uh, e English as a first language, I put EFL. So example, EFL. So I just give it a random name. And if I want a number of groups, so I can have a number of groups can be, for example, three groups. Or if I want members per group, I can do it in terms of that. If you want more groups, I mean, based on the number of students, you can change this number. Now this grouping, will be followed through for the assignments. So when you give an assignment, the grouping will be here, uh, set up here, so you can assign it by group. Okay, for the for the sake of our record, we will just set up five groups because I can see that we have around 25 enrolled users, so I just set up five. And then what happens to the odd user? The last one is that they will be put into one group. So suppose you have five into five is 25, but you have 26, this, the 26th user will be uh, append it to any of the groups. Okay, so allocate members randomly. You can do it by first name or last name, but usually by random for this particular setting, and then you submit. Okay, now we have groups here. Okay, so now you have group here, A, B, C, D. So we have group D, F, L, C, E, F, L, and D, F, L, and group. So we have these groups, which are automatically generated by the system. Once you have done all this, your groups have been set and you can assign and receive content based on the group. So assignments can be submitted by one group member. It will block the other members. For example, if in this one, it's uh, Abang Mohammed Razif is the head of the group, then you will have a block on the other, okay? So you can see Puan Arna is actually, has multiple roles because she's a teacher for the course. Okay, that's about the groups. Now, Suppose you don't, suppose the students say, we want to form our own groups. Okay, I go back, and zoom out again. Okay, now suppose a, a, a situation arises in which students say, we don't want to form groups based on the lecturer's appointment. We want to form our own groups. So the system gives students the right to do that. So Recently, Puan Salmi has requested this from the JTMK, and this is called a choice setting. So we have a choice. So there is something here known as group self-selection. You can use choice or you can use this, but this is the one more for group self-selection. So add, add this. Okay, and for example, these are groups, uh, group to, uh, to do self, for example, for this is for English language, English. Language. Syntax, for example, this is a group to study syntax, uh, syntax or grammar, as the case may be. And then you give a description for this group, what do you expect from them, your expectations, or your, basically your criteria for that grouping. So that's for instance, that group will be involved in so-and-so functions, and this is what they are expected to do. And the display description on the course page. Now, this is a very important button here, which is very in, innocuous, you can't see it, but it's an important button. Now, the, the function of this particular key is to ensure that when a student opens a page, either on a handphone or on a desktop, 
he or she will see the entire page on the first loading. Okay, this is important because from that they can make choices. If you don't click on this, they will see only a link. They won't see the entire descriptor of that particular page. Okay, now, now that you have set it up, you definitely need to enable this. So your grouping you can enable for, for example, from the 11th of March to the 21st of March, for instance, and then you block. So which means that students can only uh, choose a group based on this date. Okay, so you don't select groups from groupings, you make it all groups. And this is where you set up is minimum members per group. So usually you set up maybe five and maximum members per group will be maybe five also. I just set it up as five and maybe this set up as five. Okay, I'm just going to set default settings and you have all the common modules and you need to set it as show. So this is a student activity. So you'll just have student can manually mark the activity as complete. Okay, and you save and display. Let's see by default. Okay. Okay, so now what is going to happen is that you have groups here, but you can also enroll yourself from the group by clicking on that button. Okay, so you can choose can choose your group by using this particular button. Okay, so if then I in that case I can collapse all the groups and you can re-choose by using this particular choice button. So that's a good thing to do at the beginning of the uh, teaching session. Okay, now let's move in the next one, which is the so then we will do the basic things in the first week, which is the synopsis. Second. So the first thing I'm going to add is an activity or resource. So the first thing which you need to do by default for all courses is the synopsis, which will be categorized by the server as one. Nora, can you please share the PHP server link in the window for the PHP server so that all the lecturer can bookmark the server? Thank you. So Nora is going to share the PHP link in the window. So we'll have a chat window and you will have Please bookmark that link and keep it with you. Uh, for those who are new to uh, of those of you who are new to the system, the PHP link will only work on a UMS network, which means that we have to be in UMS in order for that link to be functional. You can't do it by even the, for example, some of us are using the uh, which one is that the uh, the virtual uh, broadband, whatever we call the virtual thing, right? So it doesn't work with that. You need to be in UMS network, logged into UMS network in order for that to work. Okay. What is that? There is something which people use VPN. VPN. It won't work on a VPN, okay? Because it needs to be not locked in. Okay, so you add the course synopsis here. So this will be our synopsis. Now, a student does not know what's table 4.2 generally. They will have to use a. You'll, they'll have follow your tag for synopsis. Okay, so you add your in, uh, your introduction here. You copy and paste from table four, and then you have your. Okay, so I just open up everything. And so now your course synopsis can be dropped here. So again, display description on the course page. I'm going to just add a synopsis from here. Have a desktop. Okay, so this will be a course synopsis. Now, legally, the students are required to download the synopsis at the commencement of each course. So you give them this uh, show activity as complete when conditions are met. So at the beginning, in the first lecture, when you do your first introduction or taklimat, you tell them that you must be aware of your course synopsis. So you need to click on it and download. And then you click on this one so you can track who has done it. Okay. And this one usually you enable, suppose you have told them, given them an instruction in the first week, you must download it. So you set this for the first week. So the first week they are forced to view the course synopsis. So later on, they cannot say that we, we did not see it. Okay, so course synopsis and course sin. And then you give it a co code name for your course. So that's, this. these are actually very useful. They are hashtags. So the system auto generates hashtags. Now the function of this is becomes clear if you are teaching multiple courses. So you, all you do is go to your main uh, dashboard window. 
you look for the hashtag, you will find that particular course synopsis. You don't have to look through the entire course for the course synopsis. Now, this one we don't do competencies because this is set by the OBE system. So this will be your file and. OK, so you're done and then you save and display. OK, so that's your course synopsis, which will be displayed and it's just an example for you. OK, so your course synopsis is set up now. One of the first thing which we may want to do in our first session is to have the icebreaker or chat session with our students. Now there are multiple platforms for chat. Usually we use, we have the Discord browser, which is used for gaming and most of the students like Discord, but the problem with using all these external tools is it creates a lot of static in the system. So if you use Discord, you'll have constant notifications coming in. So it's better to add a chat uh, block. So you add a chat block here, it's a chat, and you add this chat block. Now this chat room will only be open, we call it icebreaker for example, and this is only open during the first session from, for example, from 0900 to 0930. So you can give the time for that and it's only open on the day and you display description here. So this is a chat session, you give it a time and you can publish the time if you want to, which means the students will get a push notification saying that the chat is active at so and so time. Okay, so this is the time, for example, I set it on 11 March, because now we're already at 11 March, I set it for 15, uh, 10, you know, it's 15, 6, okay. So we have no restrictions and you have activity completion and conditions are met, which means students have to enter for that. You can give it a tag, chat one and save and display okay now if you try this out at this point in time you will actually be able to chat you can click on your chat here on the icebreaker yes so i zoom on it so now you can if you are all enrolled for the course whoever is enrolled you click here on icebreaker and you can chat and where does the notification come is here okay i'll show you i just turn it off first and i go in and chat so at the top of the window here you will see uh, your name and then there'll be a balloon here, see, so you can see this. So the chat will actually come in these two, uh, you will see a notification coming here. Let's try it out now. So I just click on this icebreaker. So a new, new window will open. So I click here, click here to enter the chat now. Okay. So somebody is already in. So I just say hello, hello, and then um, enter and then it's sending out a message okay so one Arna has also said hello and then Priscilla okay so everyone is here so you are seeing the messages coming in so this is a good way to do the icebreaker and the or initial uh, talk talk back session which we have in the beginning there are other software which you can use uh, for example I used to use the uh, introductory software but Sometimes it becomes complicated and it's also sometimes some students may not have a good network. Okay, so you have everyone on the chat and the chat is going on. Okay, so you will have a chat with the students at the first instance that's creating communication in blended learning. Okay, I'll close it and you can continue to use it. Okay. Now, how do you access all these systems from your mobile phone? Okay, so usually you will have to log on to Smart Tree and then so on and so forth. There is actually something known as Moodle Mobile. I will give you, uh, just open this window, okay? So Moodle Mobile. Earlier it was a little bit difficult to use this because we needed a pass key, but now you can install this on your phone. You can log in using your user ID and password and Moodle Mobile will be active on your phone. So please use this because this will create a separate stream from your uh, WhatsApp. So this will be only for communication with students, and then you can download all the PDF and keep the records of that. Okay, so this is the Moodle app which you have here. Okay, so that's the content. So now you can see chat, you can see notifications coming in, I toggle and you can see as they come in here. Okay, so people will toggle your system. You can try it on your system. Okay, and the chat window will be active. Now suppose I'm offline and somebody posts a message, I will see the toggle here. Now we are online, so it's not going to stream from this toggle. Okay, that's the next one. So now you're starting your week ahead. So you turn editing on. And now you have your 
<coughs> topic one. So this will be topic one. So some lecturers prefer to teach by topic. Some lecturers prefer to teach by the um, CLO or some lecturers prefer to teach by the week. It's entirely up to you. So th if this topic one, you add an activity or resource. Okay, I'm going to add the file. So the file I will add is lecture one. Okay, now because you all are using, going to use this <coughs> particular template later, I'm going to add a useful file for you, which is the MOOC file. So yes, I'm going to add the MOOC file for folder for you, so you can add uh, later on. You can visit, uh, visit it and find out more about MOOCs. Okay, so I'm going to add the MOOC folder to this. Okay, next time. <clears throat> So I will add this here. Uh, okay, this is the content for the roadshow, and I will I put in a link for the MOOC here. So now the appearance will be automatic embed or post download. Usually we will try and do a embed. Okay, so embed means the, the file will be seen in the same page. These are basically just for formatting, but they enable the system to look better. So always this one is by default, and the embedding of the file. Okay, now. The LMS has a feature which some of you may be aware of and some of you may not, which is called restrict access. Okay. Restrict access is a very interesting feature. For instance, if you are having a course and you have 14 weeks and then your course content is all online, but you do not want your lecturers to, your students, sorry, to view the course content before they complete the first week and then second week and so on and so forth. Now, you can set up a restriction so they don't get what is known as cognitive overload, which means they view all the 14 lectures in one go and then they are overloaded. So you set up a restriction. So the restriction is done this way. You add restriction, okay? And the restriction which I'm going to set is either by date, grade, group, and so on and so forth. But I'll show you the simplest one, which is activity completion. Now, let's say you don't want the student to view lecture one unless they have viewed the synopsis. So you set this, you set this on this, okay, activity completion. And then it says which activity. So the student must view the synopsis and then that's it. So now the student cannot go to this lecture one unless they have clicked on the synopsis. So that ensures that the student has viewed the synopsis before they moved on to lecture one. Now, this restriction is may not only be restricted to the content, you can also link it to a grade. For example, the student can only view lecture two when they complete the quiz and get 80%. You can set it for that as well. So this gives a certain degree of automation in the system. Okay, for this one you say, student shows activity as complete when conditions are met in order to enable the data tracking. And then you have tags. And so I just give it lecture one. Lecture one, sorry. And then I have my tag there and you save and display. Now, now you have your synopsis, icebreaker, and then you have your topic one here. Okay. Now you can see here, there's a restricted button here, restricted not available unless the activity synopsis is marked as complete. So if a student sees this page and they have not seen the synopsis, they will know. So they click here, they go back to synopsis, download it, and then they can proceed to lecture one. Are there any questions until this stage? Because uh, I cannot see the chat window because I'm broadcasting from my screen. So can you please uh, turn on your microphone and you can ask me anything at any given time. <laughs> Any questions? I just turn on the chat so I can see. Okay. Okay. So there is one message from... Okay, we can't access... Okay. Hi, Kennedy. There's a... He says that we cannot access blended learning statistic ever since MCO1 from outside and inside UMS. Okay, Panana. Okay, for that, uh, Panana and 
Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, is that I think what we need to do for that is to, okay, if you have a problem accessing that, generally we used to ask some of our colleagues to come who are on campus to click and screenshot it. That's the only solution because the this is a PHP server, so uh, JTMK has limited the access to external uh, networks. So it's open, so it's just a URL and then it doesn't have any logon. So that's why the access is restricted from outside. Otherwise, everyone will be able to access our PHP server. Okay, so that's a security thing. So we can't do that from, uh, from outside. I'm sorry about that, but that's a system limitation. Okay, so now we have created some content inside. Now we will check for activity. So assuming that I'm a lecturer and I'm delivering this content and then I want to check at any given time for student activity in the system. So this one, this particular system has got an activity setting or uh, ability to view content in graphic data. Okay, now earlier days, we have, for example, we have reports here. In the earlier days, everything was in the form of a tabulated column which is a log file. Now we, it comes in a graphic format, so it's easy to view. So reports, okay. And you have here, go down, you have something known as, this is all data, but this data will be purely in a column-based format. It's not easy to read, okay. So unless you're looking, for example, you want to find out about students attending exams and the date on the server on which they logged on, you can find it from the logs and live logs. But what we are interested in is getting instant data from a large data set. For example, you have hundreds of students and you want to track usage. So you click here, analytics graphs. And here you have the hits distribution, number of active students, content access, and grades chart. Can I show you the basic one, which is content access? So by default, you can build this graph asking for all content. Okay, and then build graph. Okay, give it some time. Okay, it'll build a graph. Okay, so it shows you, for example. So announcements has no access, English language syntax. Okay, no one has access any of the content. Now, this means that you have not clicked on that particular icon or the student has not clicked. So if you click on it, of course, it changes to green. Okay, so that's about it. Now let's look at the other parameter, which is here. So we look at this one. Okay, I look at another parameter of the report which is the analytics graphs. And I look at the number of active students. Okay, now this will give you a data set on active students. Okay, so apply. Okay, so that means now at 1400 hours, which is when we just started this, and between 1400 and 1500 hours, 24 active users, and now there are 17 active users. Now, what does this active user actually mean technically? For the system, an active user is not someone who is active in the system in terms of reading it, it's in terms of the click. So it's what it's doing, it's measuring the number of mouse clicks per link or per icon or per location on the page. So that's an activity. So you can see here at 1400 hours, there were 126 clicks in the system and at 1500 hours, you have around 174 clicks, which means that everyone is still engaged in the, so you can see whoever has clicked on the link. Okay, so that shows you the student activity. For example, if you had 50 students in the class and then you only have around, for example, you have started your lecture and you have told them in the middle, please take the, uh, please click on this link and watch this video. And then you found out that this is actually only 10. It means only 10 active students are in the class. So out of 50, you have 10. So this one is a good monitoring system because it's in real time. It's done constantly. Now, suppose you are doing some kind of research on the system, or if you are trying to um, like uh, capture data for your post file, all you do is click here and you can download the JPEG image and you can have this data recorded for your system. Okay, let me go back to the original one. I show you this one. Okay, so I go back to my reports and analytics graphs and I look at the hits distribution again. So you can see who has been accessing the system. Of course, this is only one, it's, the course is still just started, so we can't get the real data, but we get an overview of uh, what's the, okay. what's, 
Okay, let's look at content access. Okay, so I click on everything and I capture the content access. Okay, so until now, no one has access. So you can try and click just for the sake of the data analytics for the demo. I want you to click on any of the links and I will give you show you how it actually works. Okay, just click on the links randomly. Just click on the link and let's see how it works. Okay, so you have your topic one, lecture one, and then now you need to add your activity or resource. The most common one is the assignment. Now, please take note that when you do your one, seven, three, and two, right? The three, the chat will count as the three. Chat will count as three, choice will count as three. So this will all count under the category three. Okay, so this is assignment, right? So assignment edit will be, for example, assignment one, Okay, in this one, you give your introduction and the most important part will be, will be the rubric, the rubric for that particular assignment. So the students have a fair idea of how they are being graded. This you can upload your files here and then you have your submission dates, which you usually enable for assignments and submission types. Now, the link for this is 20, G, 20 MB. Okay, so you cannot upload files which are more than 20 MB. But some of your students who have more complex files, such as the, uh, for instance, video files or audio files, which have a high uh, resolution, in that case, you can ask them to upload it as a link. Okay, now in UMS, we have our Google Drive and we also have the Office 365. So you can use these features because all the students will have Office 365. They can uh, create content in Office 365 and share the link here. Okay, now, Okay, you can add restriction here. For example, you can add a restriction. Students can only complete this when they watch lecture one. So they have to, you can add a restriction here. So that means the student can only attempt the assignment when they complete lecture one. Now, this is the group mode actually here. So there's a common module setting, there's a group mode. If you use a group mode, uh, that means that you will only allow one group leader to submit in the group, okay? So that means if you if you set this as no groups, individual. If you set it as groups, it will be by groups. So you have your feedback types. This will be all files, don't change this. You have submission settings, okay? And then you have the required student to click submit button. It should be yes. Student should accept the submission statement, which is yes. So they are given a specific statement. So after they submit, they will receive the statement, they click yes, and then it goes up to the system. And if you want more than one attempt, you can change it over here. So you have group submission settings. If students submit my groups, yes, then you have to click on all these by default. Okay, if it's usually you said no, because most of the assignments are by individual. So you can, if you set this yes, then you'll have to make everything yes and no, and grouping for students, you have to set this all up all over again. Okay, so usually no then everything by default is. Now, this is a very uh, relevant button to you, which is the grade button. Now, why is this important to us when we do our final uh, marks vetting is because you can convert your entire assessment table into the grade setup or the grade book setup for the system. For example, if your assignment has got 20 percentage, 20 percentage, 20 percent out of 100. So you can set up this as a point and you can give it a maximum grade of 20. Okay. And then you scale up all your rubrics with the scale of 20. Now what's going to happen with this system is that I will show you after we complete this, how to use the grade book facility. So you have, for example, you have the, the formative and summative assessment. The formative assessment, for instance, is 70 marks and the summative is 30. The summative cannot be done using the system because that's a confidential mark set, but the formative, you can actually do it. So you have quiz, 10 marks, assignment, maybe 20 marks, assignment two, under 20 marks, and so on and so forth, and the midterm, and you can all set it up in the grade. Only thing, make sure that you, for this particular 20 marks, this particular one, you follow your table 4.2, okay, table 4.2, so you follow this marking scheme here. So example, the it was 30, then I set it as 30. And once you're done, you just save and display. 
Now you have your assignment here. Okay. Now, just for the sake of this exercise, can you just click on this and upload a blank piece of PDF, just a blank PDF page? Okay. I need only a blank PDF paper in the system. So those of you who can do it, please upload a blank PDF page in the system. And I'll show you how we proceed to the grading part, because if you do not upload the uh, blank page, I cannot grade and I cannot proceed to the next stage. So please, uh, three or four of you can just upload a blank page, a PDF page, and I will show you how to connect to that page and how to get the grade book downloaded after you do your assessment. Okay, so this course people, let me check again. So we have 25 participants until now. And again, if I want to check analytics, in course analytics, I go down here and I go to analytics, reports, and we look for analytics graph. And again, I want to check for content access. So, so I look for everything. Okay. So, okay. so probably the system is still gathering data. Just wait for a while. Okay, so I can see that one assignment submitted, one ungraded. Okay, so you can, I, after you finish four, I will show you how to use the gradebook setup. Okay, while doing that thing, uh, how many of you all have heard of this format called ICANN format? Can you please uh, put a note in the chat if you know about ICANN or no, don't know about ICANN? How many of you have? It, it, uh, it reduces your uh, quiz. Don't know. Okay, 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 okay. I will cover that ICANN format. Now, we will first uh, do the grade book and then I will do. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will cover it. We will do the grade book first and I move on to ICANN. Okay, so because you know what's happening now, we are doing the road show. Usually we do it in an afternoon, but uh, for the entire blended learning, uh, the setup, it, it's usually about two days to three days of uh, the IDP course. We should usually do it in a three days workshop, two to three days of IDP full uh, morning, afternoon, because the learning management system has to be set up from the base up, means we set it up from the grade book, the rubrics, and so on and so forth. So I will just show you how it's done. Okay, so I'll refresh and I look for submission. Okay, three submitted, so that's good enough. Thank you very much. I, I don't think you can need to take the trouble and submit more. I will just show you how to set up the grade book. Now, one of the biggest uh, challenges if we don't know how to set up grade book will be the end of the semester when you have to compile everything together and then you have to go for your marks endorsement. So that's a big, uh, it's very taxing because you, and then you can make mistakes. So please set up the grade book in the system itself, set up all the grade and you can download it in one time and then you'll have a last column. You can add your summative marks in that and then you have your sheet ready. So set up the grade book based on your assessment skill. Okay. Let's view all submission. I just grade it randomly. So you have a uh, first one. So you have a docx here. So I'll just click here. Um, so click here, for example, I'll click on. Okay, so cancel O. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I just zoom out. Okay. okay, so grading is straightforward. So you can, I, I'm sure you are all using this so you can annotate directly onto the system. You can grade here and so on and so forth. Okay, suppose you give a grade. So the marks was out of 30, right? So you give around, for example, 29. Save changes. Okay, now, now remember something. There's a small button here, notify students. If you don't want to notify your students in, immediately, you don't click on this. Okay, so if you want, yes. So you can do multiple things, so this you must be aware of. So feedback is here. 
and you can add your feedback content. You can also add, for example, uh, images, files, and other documents, for example, here, with the exception of copyrighted material. So you save changes. So I save changes and I move on to the next one. And I move on to the next user. Okay, so again, I mark something here and I grade it. 28 and I move on to the next user. And I'm going to mix. Okay. So I give it a mark. Yeah, again, I agree. Add a note. Right? What do you like? Okay. So next user. So I just I just show you three because that is going to become uh, your time. I don't want to take up your time. So I'll focus only on three safe changes. Okay. Now let's assume that we did four gradings. Okay, and then I go back to my course. Now, four of 25 have been submitted, three are ungraded, one is, un, uh, one is not graded. Okay, so I will show you how to set up the grade book. Okay, now, come here to your block, right? Usually I'm having a different block, so you will see a, you will see a similar block. The thing is a grade book setup. Now this gradebook you can set up, see, the way the gradebook is set up is, suppose you had uh, three assignments and each one had 30 marks. The gradebook will automatically follow that particular marking order, 30, 30, 30. However, if you want to scale up your marks, for example, you gave your marks 100 to each assignment, then of course you have to work with your Excel worksheet and scale it back to 30. So I would suggest for your gradebook setup, use the scale exactly as it is in your table four to save you all that trouble, unless you are very good in Excel and you can manipulate the data after download. Now, the grade book is here. So, so you have your grade book here, grade book setup. You click on the grade book setup and then you can see your grade book here. Now, you can see that assignment one has got the full marks. So, we view. Okay. And you can see who has got the marks. Okay, now. Okay, now you can see the marks over here. Assignment. 29, 28, 20, and this is the out of 30. And the course total will be the sum of all of the formative assessment. Okay, so the formative assessment will be, for example, 70 out of 100, then you'll have the marks up. So as you give more and more assessment, they will come here. Now, the thing about this is you can sort it by the name, the first name or the second name, and uh, or the surname, and so on and so forth. And then you don't have to worry about the format anymore. You, all you do is you go to the export button here. So you have set up scales, etc. You don't click on this, you go to export button. Import is when you want to import a grade book and you want to add marks, but we don't do that in the system. We click on the export button here. Now, when you click on the export button, it will ask you what format you want it in. We want it in Excel, XML, or you can export as an Excel spreadsheet. Usually we export as Excel spreadsheet. Once you're done, just click on download. Okay. It will download the Excel worksheet here. Okay. I won't open the Excel worksheet because I'm using another application, but you get the idea of how to use the grade book. So the grade book is something which is uh, a big uh, saving in terms of time and in terms of the process. So you don't have to keep on checking. Usually we earlier we have to do a check mark. This one no more. Once it's set, it's set, you mark and you are basically free from that process of manually keying in the marks into an Excel worksheet, okay? So hopefully you find this useful and can use it and please set it up at the beginning, as I said, with the scale of the table four. So that's the grader report, okay? So that's how you set it up. Now, there is one format which I, which I said I will uh, mention to you about, which is called the I can format. I just close this first and this is I can. Okay, now when you want to create any kind of question bank inside the system using the quiz button, it's quite challenging because you need to set up each and everything. But this one is used for the MCQ. So this is the format for I can. Okay, so I can setting will be like this. You set up the question, but you need to follow it exactly as it is in this format. Okay, so this will be the question, the first one. I just zoom on this. Okay, so this is your question. 
and this will be A dot, is this the one B and so on and so forth and the answer is D. Now you need to follow this exactly as it is. For example, if you have A, B, C, D, E, you can use the same thing. If you have A, B, C, you can use the same. But this particular format, this spacing, uh, this particular spacing, this spacing and this one should be followed exactly. Now all of this you will ask me where do you do it is done using notepad file. So you create this icon format in notepad file and then you have to save it. Okay, you create it and then you import. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the link to the Moodle doc for that in the chat window. Okay, I'm going to share it in the chat window. And this will actually save you time when it comes to Okay. Now Moodle has got its own um, directory and because we are using UMS LMS which is actually Moodle which is based on the Moodle open source software we can actually have the reference notes here. So this is the reference note for that. So this is the format which you use. So there are certain rules which you can use. For example, you cannot use the ACS American Standard Code for Information Interchange ASCII 2. You cannot use certain codes such as quotes because sometimes this is written in just plain text. Okay, so you say you open a notepad file, you copy, uh, you write your, compose all your questions in that, and then you save it as a text file. Okay, so text file and then you are saved. Okay, so that's how you do it. So all the rules are given here. Okay? So how to download, how to create this uh, format, you you can do it in the icon format. Now, you also have something known as a GIF format. This is even more complex. I would not recommend that you do it because that is more for assignments and text answers. Okay, so this is the I can format. Okay, now let's see how you actually do it. How you? Okay, how many of you you will use the system for quiz? Is everyone using the system for quiz? Do you know how to create question bank in quiz? If not, you can just uh, put it in the chat window. I will cover that. Are you all using the quiz? Everyone is aware of how to create a question bank in quiz? Do you want me to cover the quiz uh, question bank setup or do you already know about it as well? Okay, don't know how to create question bank in quiz as well. Okay, so there's a chat uh, message there. So I will cover that. Okay. Okay, one second. Okay, so this is about the export of grades, right? So now we move on to the quiz setup. Okay, now you want to create a quiz, a quiz in the system. So creating a quiz in the system is a little bit more complex than setting up a quiz using, for instance, a quizzes or quizzes or a, for example, a Google form. This one is a little bit more complex, but it's um, more robust in terms of the, the, the delivery of the quiz questions. The, the, the challenge with quiz comes in situations where the student is on a slow internet connection or they are using a processor which may be slower. So what happens in that case is you are logged on to UMS. So the clock for the quiz is running inside UMS server, but the clock for the students or the users end users computer may be slightly different. In that case, some of the questions may be skipped or the question time will pass. So you have to uh, be careful when you do use the quiz in the LMS, okay? The other students will report that they cannot complete the quiz. So let's see how we actually create the quiz in the system. So I'm going to turn editing on and I'm going to create a quiz here. Okay, okay so add an activity or resource and we call it quiz. So we call this a quiz. I just give it a name by default quiz. You set up your timings here. You have to give it the duration. 
the marks. And if you have any kind of negative marking, etc., you have stated in the first instance, you have your timing, so you can time the quiz. Okay, the, the time at which you'll have your quiz. Okay, for example, I just set it up to 19. And if you have a time limit for the quiz, you have to enable it here. So if your quiz will be 30 minutes, 10 questions, or 30 minutes, 15 questions, you enable that here. Okay, and of course, these are the other settings. I will go into the grade setting. So, if, for example, your grade was uncategorized. The grade to pass was, for example, 10. And you give the highest grade as the mark for that quiz. So, usually allow only one attempt. Okay, So, attempts allow the one unless you're giving a quiz which is going to be allow the students multiple attempts with penalty. So, a layout is... Okay, what is this layout button about? Okay, now let's look at it from the practical aspect of delivering a quiz online. Suppose I uh, opened a quiz or the student opened a quiz and then there are 10, 10 questions in, 10, in one page. Now from the student's perspective, that will look like information overload. So he or she will see 10 questions on a single page. So that's going to become, uh, look, it's stress you out. But we have to also see the system uh, resources. Now, suppose I delivered one question per page. Okay, every time I the student finish one question, yes, submit the answer, and then they have to go to the next page. Now, this is going to actually cause a system overload, which means the student, if their internet connection is slow, they will definitely have a problem with the time. So that is why for so if your students, if your students have this issue, means most of them are now they will they will obviously be off campus. Usually set up and get all the ten questions on one page. Okay, this is the technical or the practical solution to overcoming that issue. Because if you do one page per question, every time they click, a new page is loaded. I would recommend that you do the ten questions. Suppose you have twenty questions, use ten questions per page, so they only load twice. So that will definitely a system in the system reload now the question behavior is obviously you do a shuffle yes because you don't want two students to see the same window at the same time and then screenshot and so on and so forth and then usually you'll have a deferred feedback on each question the review option will be there student can review their question appearance restriction and attempt so suppose you want to give the student a second chance you can actually put in a code here. So this will be code one, two, three, four. I just give it a code. So if the student says, uh, I could not complete the quiz because of technical issues and so on and so forth, and you check your system log and it's true, then you can give them a code to re-attempt that particular quiz set. So that's, you need to give a code. So you have to put an extra restriction attempt and give a code. The overall feedback will be, uh, okay, so well done, if it's 100. And if it's not done, so you can set up a grade boundary, for example, at 50, please retake the quiz. After revision. Okay, sorry. After revision. So if you tell them, please retake the quiz after revision. So, okay, so you can add a feedback here. Common module settings and restrict access. No, this one you can add a restriction if, for example, you only ask them add restriction, only attempt a quiz after you complete lecture one. You can add it here. So activity completion. Uh, so you must mark as lecture one. So it has to be marked as complete. If you don't want it, you just click off. So there's no restriction. Or you can add the date. So the student can only answer the date from 11 March. For example, from... 1600 hours today, and so you can add a restriction. So the student must can only view the quiz there. The quiz is there, but they cannot attempt it until the date. So this is a good way to set the date. So students can know they know the quiz is there, but they can only access it when they have the access to that date. Okay, so I just call this as complete when conditions are met, and I add a tag for that called quiz one. Okay, save and display. I just said this. 
20. Okay, it's setting, it's asking for a grade, so I just need all this. Some kind of setup. Okay, so that's the quiz which has been set up. Okay, now the quiz, when you set it up this way, this quiz is actually devoid of all questions. So you need to set up the quiz in terms of the question bank. Now, there are two ways to set it up. Is One is to import a question bank in icon format, and the other one is to set up a question bank by yourself. And this question bank setup, if you are going to set up, for example, 100 questions, please give yourself around uh, maybe around eight to nine hours to set up the question bank because the process of creating the question bank is time consuming. Okay, so if you are a new user, you're setting up question bank, you have to, it takes time. So now you have to, uh, you have your quiz ready, you have to click on edit quiz. Okay, now you have to, you can either set up a question bank as such, means you can set it up for each quiz, or you can create a question bank and set it up and you can back it up and use it later. Usually we create a question bank, usually lecturers will have a question bank of around 100 questions, which they have created, and then they will set up a question bank over here. Okay. So we have a question bank here. So you have a question here and you can set it up for a question bank. So move towards the side and you will see here, question bank, and you set up your question bank. Now, the way you set it up is very simple. It says create a new question. And when you create a new question, you have only these choices. You can't add, for example, right? This is the thing about this, this question bank is you cannot add uh, mathematical formulae in the question. If you want to have mathematical formulae, you will have to scan the integral sign, differential sign, you have to scan it. I think that doesn't apply in your particular uh, Pusat because you all are mostly language based, but certain things like scripts, like you are teaching calligraphy or uh, the Javi script or you are teaching the Chinese script, calligraphy, you cannot do that over here. You'll have to actually scan the image, upload it, and then you have to ask the student, what does that? For example, what is the phonetic behind that it needs to be done? Usually we set up the simple one, for example, multiple choice. I will just set up one to show you how. So this will be the question name will be MCQ1. This will be the question text. This, the student will not see. This, this is not seen by the student. This will be the question text. For example, uh, what is of, uh, just set up, uh, just set up a random question and you'll usually have default mark one, which will be Okay, so you can set up either multiple choice or you can set up one answer. Okay, so if it's multiple choice, generally you'll have to split, but if it's only one answer, you get 100 marks for one answer. If it's multiple, you have to have 50, 50, and so on and so forth. This two is correct. So this is the general feedback. It's the feedback you give to the student. So you need to program all of these things inside. So it's uh, quite time consuming. So one answer only. So choice one will be, for example, will be London. And then the other one will be set up the next one, Paris, and so on and so forth. And this will be choice three, and then Copenhagen. Okay, so you just set up something. So the first answer, you get 100% marks, which is full mark for that particular question. And then for this one, you get none. You can also give negative marking, but none and none usually. So none and none, and then you, so you can, you can go up to uh, maybe five or six, and then you save changes. Now this question is created over here. Okay. Now the next kind of question you can create is create a new question. You can create true or false. The true or false is here. You add, and then you call it for example true or false. This is not seen by the student. This is only seen by you. This will be. Okay, just set up one random question.
Okay, so you just give a statement. Sorry, I'm setting up for MQ, MCQ. Yes, I just set up the wrong answers. So the average boiling point of water at sea level is 90 Celsius, and the default mark will be. So this will be a default. Yes, so this will be. So the correct answer is actually false. So you can give a feedback. Yes, you are correct. Yes, you are correct. We can add more content so that you can say, for instance, the average temperature is at higher altitude will be lower or something like that based on your understanding of the subject. Correct answer is false and the correct answer is true. Then you have to go and say read up or so and so forth. So you can give a, you can give a answer for that or a feedback for the respective answers. The correct answer is actually false. If it, were, if it was true, you select here. Okay, this is by default is false. And then you save changes and then that's it. So now you have two questions over here. So these are just two questions. In addition to that, you have multiple sets of questions. You can give a short answer. But if you give the short answer, it has to match exactly to what is given by a student. So if they use a different, uh, like slightly different spelling, the meaning will be different. You have numerical, essay, calculated, and so on and so forth. So you have drag and drop also onto image. Okay, so you have multiple answers. And if you do a descript description one, this one you will have to grade it manually. Okay, this is like receiving a feedback. So this one is manual grading. Okay, so these are the different choices given to you, which is a lot. And it covers almost all the element. Okay, now you have created your question bank here. So how, what you do is you go to your quiz, okay, and then you edit quiz and you add questions, okay. So you can select multiple items. From a question bank. So you click here, one second, I just zoom so you can see. Okay, so you click here, you select multiple items, and you add here, add from a question bank. If you want to create a new question, you add here, random is here, you add from a question bank. Okay, now you come back here, zoom out, I zoom out so you can see. Now I want to add the questions, so I just add these two. Okay, and I add selected questions. Okay, now these are two, both these questions will be in the single page. So if you repaginate, then you'll see, for example, see, then I'll put only one question per page, which I don't want to do because I'm afraid of the network. So what I do, I say, if I have 10 questions, I usually have 10 questions on one page. You save it. So the maximum grade is 10. Uh, this one you need to set based on your grade book. For example, in your table 4.2, you set quiz, 10 marks for the entire, you have only one quiz and you have 10 marks for that quiz. You set it 10. If it is, if it is uh, 20 marks, you set it at 20. So this will be the maximum grade for that particular quiz. Okay, save. Okay, and then you're done. Now your quiz will be ready for deployment. Okay, now your quiz is here and it's ready for deployment in the system, but it's only available from 11 March at 4 p.m. So only at 4 p.m. you can actually click the quiz and access it. Okay, this is the way in which you set up the quiz. Okay, any more questions related to quiz? Check the chat window. Okay, there's no more input in the chat window. Okay, so that's about the quiz. I close the chat window and I do the import and export. Okay, now let's look at another feature which you will have to use when you commence your course. For example, you have been teaching this semester's course maybe in the previous uh, semester or the semester before that, prior to that. And you don't want to go through the entire process of uploading each and every file, creating each and every content and so on and so forth. So what you can do is when the course is completed on week 14 is you go to this button here called backup. Okay, backup here. Yeah. Okay, so this is a backup file, backup setting. So you will see something called backup settings. Ideally, what is good to do is to create two backup files. One is backup file with all the user names with this button click here. 
enroll users. I just zoom on it. So one is a backup file with all enroll users. Now this backup file is something which you can create and store in your drive for your uh, course file. I would recommend you do this because the backup file will contain all the evidence, everything from that particular course, the lo logs, etc. But you also want to create another backup file for your course itself, which is without the users. So I would suggest you create two backup files and store them in your uh, PC or your laptop and back them up on your Google Drive. So that's that's just a precaution for you. So in, ca in case you have any file loss, you won't have a problem. So you create a backup file. Now, if I create this backup file without enroll users, I go to next and it will show me what backups I want to make. So I don't have anything here. So I just delete all these other stuffs. I don't have anything to back up from this file. And then I go next. Okay, I have all this content here. And I go to next. Perform backup. Okay, there's a button for now. The backup file is actually created. And then you click on continue. Okay, now where is this backup file stored? I have stored up, I've created many backup files. And you can see that this is today's backup file, 11 March at 3 55 p.m. I created this backup file. Now this backup file I can download by clicking here. Now, why do you create this backup file is the entire Moodle format is stored in the backup file. So for example, if you am teaching this course this year and then next semester I'm not teaching the course and then the semester after that I have to retake the course. I just simply restore this into my course. So the way you do it is you can click on the restore button here. I created a restore dump for you and I create this course. Okay. Now, when I do the restore button, I have to ensure that the username, so it will show you what it wants to restore. Continue. Okay. And then I can look up for the restore file here. Okay. Now I won't restore it because there are too many files in the system. If you have your specific course code, you key in your course code here and then you can restore it. Okay. So, So I've created a course actually here. So I search for a course called Restore. Okay. So there are too many courses here. So okay, there's a there's a file here called Roadshow Restore. Okay, you can see it here. I have created this specifically to restore files just for demo. Okay, so I'm not going to <laughs> disrupt any files in the learning management system. So I have this file called Roadshow Restore. Okay. So search. Okay. So I continue. Okay. It asks me questions. Next. Everything is done. And okay. Next. Perform restore. Now, when you do this perform restore, right, depending on where you are, if you are at home, it may take longer. If you are on a, now I'm on a network inside UMS, so it will be faster. So I have a course. Now, see, we were earlier in a course called PPIB Roadshow. Now we are in a course called Roadshow Restore. Okay. Now, this Roadshow Restore is basically emulating entire, uh, entire content from PPIB, but your users won't be here. Okay. The users are not there. It's only me. So this is the way you back up your entire course and there is no uh, headache anymore for you. Okay, so two things which I would say, suggest to improve, improve your efficiency. One is back up your file and restore it. The second one is to uh, ensure that you have your grade book. These two things will save you a lot of time based on experience from all lecturers and sources. That's what we recommend to the respective lectures. Okay, so I go back to the course itself one minute let's go back okay this was what you want to do I just go back because it's easier for me to find the file. Okay, go back to my PPIB roadshow. 
Okay, so that's the content backup and restore. So this one you must uh, do for all your courses and preferably uh, keep it as a record for your course file. Now, when you try to open that restored file, right, you will download the file. Uh, it will not open in a standard window. You can only open it in a Moodle format. In this particular format, you can open it. You can't open it in a normal browser window, but all your files will be there in that, including all your PDF files. Those ones you can open. Okay, so that's the basically all the functions we cover, which are needed for you to function in that. So we have the, in addition to that, of course, we have the feedback. I'm sure you all have all used the feedback. So you have the feedback and the forum. So you can create a forum here to discuss, or you can create a feedback here. Okay. Can the road show restore? Okay. Okay. One second. One second. I have a question here. Please excuse me while I. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can the roadshow restore be used as new course without having to ask PV to create a new course every semester? Yeah, no, okay. So for, uh, okay, Dr. Priscilla, okay, for this one, right, what you need to do is like, okay, uh, when, the, when the semester starts first, the PPI, uh, the PP will create the courses based on the data from the SMP system. So we create that based on the data. Now, once the course is created, you can restore into that. For example, semester uh, one, Session one, for example, your previous semester, you need to have a course uh, destination. Okay, you can back up your old file. Backup is recommended upon completion of the 14th week. So when you finish week 14, you back up and you restore it when you receive your new course for the next semester. I hope, does that answer your question, Dr. Priscilla? Yes, that means we still have to create a new course, right? Then do the backup. Absolutely correct. That's you need to have your new course ready. So. Otherwise, you cannot back up. Now I'm using an admin terminal, which is uh, like, so I just created something known as backup. So just to show you all what is that backup. So that backup thing will be your new course, technically. Okay, so that's how okay, we do it. Yeah. So are you all doing it every time, by the way? Are you all doing it every semester, backing up and restoring? Yeah, yeah, I do that. Okay, okay. Now, please follow that. That's a good practice for everyone to follow. Please back up and restore because it will save you a lot of time. Otherwise, you'll have to do everything from de novo. You have to start programming the system all over again. Okay, now, having said that, I will show you the OER system. So, just to uh, highlight the usefulness of OER in, in creating content. Okay, so, uh, okay, those of you who do not have an OER account, I think most of you have. But if you allow any new lecturers or any new participants who do not have an OER account, please do this. Go to oer.ums.edu.my. I'll share the link with you. And you create one second. I will, yeah, I will just go to chat. Laura, can you please share the link in the chat? oer.ums.edu.my. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay, those of you who do not have an OER account, please click on that link and then you click on the register button here. And we will register your account because we, uh, if it's good that we do it during the roadshow. So we do it in one go. Nora is here, she's the admin for the OER. And then you can upload your content directly. Okay, so please uh, key in, uh, register here, uh, key in your email address, and then you register your, yourselves here. Once you register, you can upload content in the OER system. Now, in the OER system, uh, the OER system is, gen is what is known as a repository, a repository-based system. What is a repository is that it's a, it's a large folder set. It's a, basically a database, but a database which is searchable by all search engines outside of UMS. That is why we have a separate login for the system. It's, it's not part of the UMS um, I mean, a single sign on because this one is accessible to the general public. Now, when you put up any content here into the system, it will be stored in your respective faculty or institute or PUSAR or center. <coughs> Give one second, I just scroll. Okay, let me find PPIP. Please register and Nora will help you through the process. Okay. 
Okay, now if you click on here, I think uh, Juan, Eugenia and all have been active here. So you can see all your content here. You have educational videos, ebooks, e notes, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is an e note. Now, suppose I want to teach this particular course, okay, with apologies, I'm just going to click on the course, okay, so. Okay, this is a very good example of a PowerPoint uh, document, which you can see, okay, so you have e note here. And this is the URL. Now, what is done here is that you have a URL here. For example, this particular lecturer, Chloe Chek Kim, has got a URL here. Now, what you all you have to do is when you are creating your lecture, you no longer have to upload a full PDF file. All you do is you go to here, you control and you control C, copy this, go back to your course, and then you create here a link. Okay, so you go back to URL here and you add the link here and you can add your lecture note here. So you put up external URL and this will be your lecture. Okay. Appearance will be embed and then you have restrict activity completion is when the conditions are met and then you save and display. Now with apologies to the lecture. Actually this I have done is you know what I'm doing? I'm actually accessing somebody else's lecture note and I'm using it in my system. Okay. Now, ethically, we can't do that, right? Because that is the, uh, is somebody else's content. So I have to acknowledge here. So be careful with this particular lecture. Okay. So when I use this lecture, right? Suppose I'm, a, so I'm using this, reusing this lecture. I have to actually go and I have to acknowledge the user in this. This is one of the courtesies with OER systems. Okay, so you have to go back. I go back to this and I edit here. Okay, I go to edit setting. Now what I have to do is I have to go back to my, this one, this metadata. Okay, and I have to show the full item record. So I have the metadata file here. So I have to acknowledge this particular lecturer here. So I have to copy this, the contributor's name, and I have to add this over here. So I have the title, author, source, and the license. Okay, so this is the title will be the lecture name. I have to copy the lecture title here. And I have to, the author, I have to copy the name of the author here. And the source will be the URL, which is here. Okay, and the license. So our license is CCBY. NCSA. What means is that our UMS license is Creative Commons, shareable, non-commercial, and share alike. So anyone, no one can use this. So this particular lecturer has to be acknowledged. If you are using other people's content, please use this particular uh, format. Otherwise, it's considered plagiarism. Okay. So suppose I use this content. So lecture is here, author is here, the uh, the Sumba the source and the license. This is called a tassel attribution. And once it's all done, you can save and display. And now you have your lecture here. So you have your, so when somebody downloads, they will see this T-A-S-L. Okay. So we are tracking this. So we, suppose you have a lecture, you have content here in the system. This is actually all having is tracked by the JTMK. At any given time, if you want to determine how many people have downloaded your lecture, you can actually ask us the information and we will give it to you. Okay, so this is the way in which you utilize content from the databases. So generally we create a content there so that we um, allow others to reuse our content. They will reuse it anyway, because when we give away a lecture note in our system, others can download and reuse it. But when we put it in the OER, they can reuse it, but you have they have to attribute it to you. And in any case, even if they don't do it, the metadata, for example, someone uses this particular link as in here. One second, this particular link. Okay, this link will be here. This lecture link will be actually captured by our OER repository. We will know how many people are downloading that particular lecture by simply observing the data. Okay, so that's a kind of attribution. Actually, in, the, in uh, some universities overseas, they use that as a kind of a hit distribution is used like some kind of an index 
of that particular lecturer's uh, like um, prominence or visibility. Okay, you can track that numbers. Just as you have Facebook likes and social media tags, you can actually track these uh, use uh, track the user IDs in the uh, OER system. Okay, so those of you who have not registered, I think uh, there are a lot of content from PPIB. So it's a lot of content here. Okay, so thank you very much for depositing your content because this is actually a service to the educational the community of users. Okay, so that's about the OER system. Okay, now we have almost come to the end of the training. So you have any questions? Look for chat. I'm looking for chat. Any questions or any specific thing um, you want me to cover extra? Any uh, extra information? Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, Puan Arna has asked, oh, yeah, link to the ELNPT2. Okay, right. Okay, I will give, I will show you this one. Huh? So, this is actually found out by uh, Puan Eugenia. I'll show you how to do this. Okay. Now, Suppose you created your content in the OER. OER is not linked to the ELNPT. Now, over a period of time, right? Because I try, I do trial and error in my system using my own ELNPT as a trial. So what I did is you 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 can actually link this back to your ELNPT because OER is not linked to this. So what you need to do is you need to go to SMPPI. Okay, go to our SMPPI. Yeah, you can see this. Okay, log in. And then you go here. You go to publication version 2. Point. Go here. Okay, close. You just type something. Add a new publication. Let's zoom up. Add a new publication here. Okay. Usually it will search for possible duplicate. It won't allow you to do anything. So I just type something like A, B, C, D, E, and just search. Otherwise it will search for another application. Okay, there's no possible, uh, no search. So you can go to the record, but before you do this, you'll do this here. Click general. Okay, click on general and then next to proceed. Okay, now what happens here is you're given the categories here. Now, what we have right in our OER repository is a, is a non-peer reviewed and it's non-indexed. These two things are there, non-peer reviewed, non-indexed. So it's a non-indexed content which is means it's not indexed in Scopus, WOS, and EA, EA, all those databases. And it is also non-peer reviewed, means no one has peer reviewed it after, so it's not like a normal one. So you can either put a general or article. Okay, I put a general, and then here in this, I can put it as a, you have many things over here. So usually for the, uh, for the um, content, you can put it as note or lecture note. Okay, so you can put it here. Then I put in an ISBN number. This one is not there. Uh, there's no DOI number. So for this one, you can actually, you don't have to add because if you put a DOI number, it look for a specific DOI uh, classifier. You can put in your uh, title here, abstract this one, all your key in, keywords. And if it's outcome from your research field, you can put in this one over here. Or if it's from some publication, you have to click some images and then you want to link it back to your grant, your niche grant or your SPK grant or whichever grant you can add it here. Then you have to modify all these. Of course, you follow your own thing. Digital, usually this is a digital type. You add in your date, all these you have to add. Okay. And you need to click in the link here. So, okay. Now. Okay. So here you need to, you don't have indexing coverage, right? So for this one, there's none. Uh, so this one you key in according to what you know because most of us publish so you already have all this we know how to do all this but this is the one which is very important here you need to add the url the url is from the the one which i copied you remember i copy and paste as the link this one has to be over here because without this url they will not be able to verify your particular document so you need to have the url and if possible you need to upload the, <laughs> the file uh, the plain PDF or the JPEG file here. And once you do everything, you submit it for verification. Now, with this particular kind of verification, so the PPI will look after the index 
and library. So they will verify the index publication, which are under Scopus, WOS, and so on and so forth. But the one which is non-indexed, they will also go to the Mr. ID. So you have to contact Mr. ID and they will um, he will help you. If you have a problem with the verification, you can contact him. So once you upload it there, usually you contact uh, after that, you can contact Mr. ID and he will, he looks after this currently. Later on, I don't know, he will change, but currently is Mr. ID. So if he changes to somebody else, uh, we will find out and we will tell you, we will let you know because Juan Eugenia is the one who checks the current uh, officer in charge of this particular system. So once you do everything, you go and you upload it and then you save. Okay, so that's how you basically transfer it upon Anna. You transfer it into the system. Okay, any other question related to the system? Okay, there's a form there. Is that a form for something? A Google form? Oh, I don't know. Uh, it's an attendance link. Okay, okay. I thought it was a link to some link which I need to click on. It's okay. Any other question, Juanarna, related to the system or now there any difficulties which you all face, which your lecturers face with the system? Yeah. Hi, Eugenia. Oh, you're, you're okay. Hi, I'm good. Um, uh, still recovering, but um, I think there's this question from uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, yeah. He asked about was this OER being approved by UMS management as recognition in ELNPT in the first instance? Okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Eugenia. Yeah, actually, the previously, right, in the previous session, that is the 2020, I remember I had, uh, because we wanted to try it out, so I use, an ex I did an experiment, I actually upload there, and it is actually verified and recognized in the system, but I don't know how the points are, but for MOOC, it was 1.1, .1. so for MOOC is equivalent to 1.1 .1 index publication, but for the OER content, I'm not sure regarding the quantum or the weightage given to the OER, the OER uh, content. Okay, but for MOOC it is 1.1. .1. That is for sure. That one I have seen the numbers, but for for the non-index, that I don't have a figure on that, Mr. Kennedy. Okay, so Maybe there is one. There is a, yeah, yeah, there's one from uh, Mr. Oiki. Yeah. Um, he asked about to set to see the number student in the name list in smart tree. Yeah, yeah, sure. You can see that here. You can actually go back to this one, people, go to the top of the course, people, and you will see the student list here. Okay. So this is everyone who has registered for the course. Is that what you meant, Oiki? Is that the correct thing which you wanted to know? I mean, student number means not number of students. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Matrix number. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Okay, so you go to this course, right? Actually, if you can see the, your grade book, right? Grade book here, grades. Uh, usually, you will see the student number here. You have to add up on this. Okay, one minute. I go to the one. You need to check one, one by one. Da. Uh, no, no, no. You can you can actually get it. Usually, when I download the grade book, the students' uh, uh, numbers will come there. One second, one second. Oh. Because currently, right, you all are registered all as as lecturer, lecturer don't have a course, uh, a, a number, yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. have a number. Uh, usually you come here, you go to people, okay? Yeah. And in the people, right, you will see your name here, but here you cannot see our on number because we don't have a matrix number. You will see another column here for matrix number. Oh. Okay, so if you want so to see that. Yeah, for yeah. student, yeah. Yeah, I tell you how yeah. to actually view it. You uh, you click on grade book, you go to grade book, yeah. Yeah, and then you can uh, you actually export. You click here, export, export oh, here. Okay, export yeah. button here, and then you can export the Excel spreadsheet. Now, when you ex export this Excel spreadsheet, you will see the names of all the students with the number at the side. The student oh. number. Yeah, but even then, if you don't see it, you when you do your normal view here, you will see the 
email address and you will see the number here after this column there will be a number of the but because we are lecturer we can't see our numbers oh okay okay yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. so you will see it by default here in this page okay, thank you okay welcome um hello uh, dr yeah, kamet yeah. uh, there yeah. is another questions here yeah. uh, if the students are enrolled from the specific course in smart ums are all their yeah. homework assignments submission will be missing too yes yes everything will go missing it will all disappear oh uh, so the lecturer need to like uh, back up or download for like uh, mqa pur purpose is it okay so there is a, actually inside the system right there is a system to prevent the student from unenrolling from the course but generally we don't set that button because sometimes the student after two weeks they may want to change right mm. but so you tell your students specifically please do not unenroll from the course because if you unenroll you will lose all your data all the data will be lost it cannot be restored anymore so that is why we tell our students please do not unenroll from the course we tell them at the beginning please don't unenroll from the course or else the data will be lost all the data relate all the quiz and the assessment everything will be gone okay we have to inform them uh, regarding that at the beginning of the course uh, so the lecturer uh, couldn't achieve like uh, achieve all the uh, assign students assignments in the in smart ums is it yeah if they unenroll uh, it will all be gone uh, okay, okay. Uh, we, we have to tell the student that because uh, actually there is a, I can give you a sheet. There's actually one um, uh, information sheet. I think Nora can share with you, which Mr. Afizi has done, but that is for the, to do that. You need to go in deeper into the course and you need to lock in there. They cannot, uh, how do you say unenroll anymore, but it's, uh -huh. uh, it's inside the system. Okay. So you need to go into the, now we already set up the course. So. I cannot show you how to do it, but we have an instruction on that, how to prevent students from unenrolling from the course. So there's a setting which says, do not allow students to unenroll. If they want to unenroll, they will click, but cannot unenroll. For that, they have to again contact the lecturer or the administrator. We will share that with you. Okay, hi. Any other question? I'm trying to go into it, but if I don't do, I don't want to go into this because, okay, because we are already running this course. So if I try and, okay, I won't do it now. I will give you the link later because we are already having the courses and means in this particular one, everyone has enrolled. So later on, I give you the method. Okay, doctor, who wants it? Who wanted it, uh, Poonarna? Someone wanted that information? Uh, uh, it's okay, Prof. <laughs> I, I will pass I will to the person. from uh, Nora. Hello. Hello. Has everyone enrolled already to the OER system? Any other questions which are there? On the uh, there is one in the chat box. Why cannot upload submission in OER? Okay, okay. That one is, uh, have you um, have you just um, joined the OER just now? Nora says there are only 14 submitter until now. So have you just joined the OER, registered recently? The person who cannot add content? You can just turn on the microphone and inform because if you have just registered, usually Nora will have to do a setting for you so that you can become a submitter. Once you register, there's one one time setting for submission. If that setting is not done, uh, then you cannot submit. Okay, so. Okay, so Dr. Ruth, okay, so uh, Nora, can you check? She will check. 
Dr. Ruth, uh, Nora will check for you. She, the, it's done instantly. Usually it's because um, when you register for the first time, if you have not deposited content the first time, then uh, it's usually we face that the default issue. Any other question related to? Okay, Nora has said, can you try Dr. Ruth? Can you check your, refresh your page? You may have to log in, log out, and then you have to check. So we will see the reports. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Anybody else who has that problem, right? You just uh, inform uh, Nora now, and then we will show you how to. Wait, okay, so. Okay, so that's about the system itself. Okay, so. Any other issues or questions or anything else you want me to explain regarding the system or OER or anything related to the course, I will can do that for you. One, Arna, is there any other element you want me to cover? Uh, uh, for now, no, Doctor, but uh, maybe we are going to do next session on MOOC. Okay, okay. You're, you're okay, right? With all this, so the system I understood completely, right? Yeah. The system, okay. okay. So I was waiting if there is anybody want any information on the quiz and other components as well. Okay, so I will focus on the MOOC now. Okay, so actually I uploaded the course here. One second, huh? just give me one second while I log on to Office 365. I just log on to Office 365, easier to use. Okay. 
So, okay, Becca, hi, Shay. Okay, Shay, so, okay, sorry about that. Okay, can you see the screen already? Not, not yet. Not yet? Okay, okay. So, I will just project PDF because uh, Office 365 is a bit slow. Takes time to share. So, because we are using the uh, Microsoft Office WebEx, right? There'll be a slight, there's a slight lag when we start sharing a screen. But for the users of Microsoft Office 365, if you want to use your video broadcasting, I would suggest that you use something known as Microsoft Stream. Are, are you all using Microsoft Stream? Are you all aware of Microsoft Stream? One second, this is very slow. Still loading. Still loading, right? Okay, okay, done already. So, this is the problem with the uh, Microsoft WebEx. So, it usually will tend to run slow. Okay, before I go into this one, right? And before the system actually crash, oh, that's problem. I just show you a uh, log out from this bus. Okay, now we are we are all having the uh, Office uh, licensed Office software, right? Okay, now this is where you store your videos for your MOOCs and your lecture notes, etc. There's something known as Microsoft Stream. Okay, this is the micro Microsoft Stream account. Now, this Microsoft Stream account is like a YouTube account, but the only difference is that it's only viewable by our selected users, which are the UMS. So, only the staff and students who have registered in UMS can use Microsoft Stream. To see, to log in, right, just sign in with your regular UMS user ID and password. So Microsoft Stream, will, so I'm already logged in here. And in this Microsoft Stream, you can actually upload all your lecture notes here. So if, you're, if you want to view your videos, you can securely upload here. So you suppose you recorded your WebEx meeting and you want to share it in uh, with your students. You don't want to use YouTube, you can go to Microsoft Stream and you upload your content here by clicking on this securely upload button okay and then you can upload your mp4 file okay so there's a video tutorial on that and you want to create new content you click here create a uh, button here or you can upload video here okay so you upload the video in an mp4 format and then you can share that video with your students so i would recommend that you use this for sharing your content for for your lectures your recorded lecture, you can store it in Microsoft Stream. And then you can share it only with your selected users. Okay. So we have to focus on the MOOC because this is one of the UMS uh, KRAs. So I'm going to show you some briefly introduce you to the MOOC. And those of you who are interested in uptaking this MOOC uh, challenge, uh, from here. Okay, somebody has uh, one minute. I just check the chat. I need to know from your experience on e-learning any UMS student experiencing connection problem from rural, remote, and island communities. Actually, there are many students who are experiencing, uh, Mr. Kennedy, actually many of the students do experience these issues. So the only way we can address this is by there, there are actually multiple ways in which you can address this issue. One of them is by um, installing uh, Moodle 
in the platform itself. So you, this Moodle uh, learning management system is actually can run even on your desktop. Okay. And the only way, uh, so for example, if you have a student who has a problem with accessing this content, you can actually install Moodle in a desktop. You don't even have to be online and your content is actually given via a pen drive. So just now I've created a backup file. That backup file can be backed up onto a pen drive on a simple USB drive. And the student can be uh, asked to install Moodle on their, on their system. Okay. If you really need help on this, you can ask me, uh, I will show you how to do it. You need to install what is known as an Oracle virtual machine in your system. And once you have an Oracle machine, you can run Moodle like as you see it now in your respective laptop or desktop, and it doesn't require much memory and all that. If you want to know how to do it for the rural communities, I can show you how to set up an Oracle VM in your machine. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question which was posted in the chat. Okay, so coming back to the UMS MOC, um, this is actually something which needs to be done in order to uh, focus on the uh, on the uh, basically on the external users. So the MOOC actually caters to a different audience as compared to students. These are generally the lifelong learner, the um, alumni, and the people who want what they call just-in-time education or just-in-time courses. So this was proposed as a part of the globalization strategy as well as part of the um, the income generation strategy for public universities. Now, the courses for the, the, these uh, MOOCs are actually based on courses of interest to the general public. For example, if you did a course in marine archaeology, for instance, which is a very specific subject, you may not have many users. But if you did a course in wellness or, in, for example, in programming uh, database structures. Okay, these are courses which are very common and very widely used. So the MOOC has a specified audience. If you want your MOOC to be more popular, you need to cater to the audience which is looking for generalized courses. Okay, because if you have specialized, it's very hard to reach out to the audience. Now the MOOC is generally designed in terms of four to six weeks. It is assessed automatically and it is certified by the institutional end user. So if you're, if the end user or the end content creator of the MOOC is, for example, PPIB, the certification for the MOOC is issued by the PPIB. Now for the certification, I have asked specifically from NQA regarding the uh, type of certification. They say that they don't have any standard for certification, but it's generally based on the institution itself. MOOCs are generally for a duration of four to six weeks. And the content creation is basically uh, video lectures. So we will be installing a e -studio, iStudio, what is known as iStudio or a recording studio in the Center for e-learning, where you can come and record your content on a green screen, and then you can basically uh, create video content for the MOOCs. Okay, so for MOOC lectures are quite different from the conventional lecture. Uh, MOOC lecture will have a recording of around 10 to 20 minutes. And they'll have a one CLO generally, and they'll be very specific to a topic. Okay. For example, if you are teaching phonetics, the uh, book will be, for example, only on certain phonics, okay, not on the entire language itself. The assessment for MOOC is done automatically. So I have set up in, for example, in our system, I have set up automated MOOCs, and we can show you how to do that. So what an automated MOOC means is that the student comes in, they log in, and then you don't have to have any anything to do with the student at all. When they complete their MOOC, you will get a report and you can certify them directly because the system is entirely automated. You don't have to be involved in the MOOC in terms of the delivery. This will save you a lot of time. Of course, some MOOCs do have a live lecture. The interaction with students can be either via forums or via live lectures, or some MOOCs have almost no interaction at all. Certification is based on um, what we call, if you see, look at the issue of certification for MOOCs. Generally, the MOOCs are certified using what is known as a blockchain technology. If you all are aware of the uh, different blockchain systems which are there, Ethereum uh, and all those ones which certify the uh, Bitcoin and so on and so forth. So MOOC certificates are generally certified using blockchain. So the certificate can be digitally, it becomes a digitally encrypted certificate which can be validated. So that's the certification for MOOC. 
Of course, we don't offer this currently at UMS. We leave the certification to the respective faculty. <coughs> okay, now the major uh, content process of creation of MOOC is the content creation and so on and so forth, the uh, assessment, but it's a one time content creation system. Okay, this is what I mentioned. Uh, usually, what we propose in UMS is an automated model for delivery of MOOC. Okay, so this is the basic MOOC. We have five weeks of course with five lectures of 10 minutes each, and then you have around five quizzes and uh, delivery uh, learner driven. What this means is that the student can take the five weeks course maybe in a weekend over five hours, or they can do it over five weeks entirely up to the student. And there are also what are known as advanced MOOCs. <laughs> These are advanced MOOCs are where you have a proctored examinations, which means the student has to come to us examination center and do a deliver a normal exam with, of course, with the proctored means they cannot do an open MOOC test. Now, how do we develop the MOOC at UMS? I've given you the steps. So we have a course template, which we complete, submit to PEP, uh, and then we submit the names of two reviewers. The reviewers will review the MOOC because we need to maintain quality in order to comply with KPT requirements. And then we have to modify it based on the reviewer requirements, and then you deploy it at SMART2. So the course template is actually here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share this lecture note with you in the uh, in that in that folder which I've created for you. So I will share this folder. So I will download it and share it for you so you can get it later on. Okay, so I will so you can download it. There's a link here. You click on the link and you can access the template. You submit the template to our director. And then the reviewers will be appointed by PEP. They'll receive official letter of appointment. They will complete the review within two weeks. We give them two weeks and they recommend changes and you do a course improvement. Okay. And then we will give you the uh, MOOC content and you can deploy it. So deployment is basically you can ask us at PEP because uh, to deploy it or you can, we'll give you, uh, we'll create a course instance for you. So just as you had a course code, you'll have a MOOC for you. So MOOC, for example, on English language, or English as the first language. So you have the MOOC and then you upload it into the uh, system itself. So you have your MOOC and then the course is delivered. So once you download, once you have created the MOOC, you deliver it. So what, what happens is the MOOC is actually operating independently of you. So once you create it, you don't have to keep on monitoring it. All you have to do is uh, look up the certification. So for instance, if you said that the MOOC certificates will be issued on May 31st, you can actually issue the certificates on May 31st for those students who completed the MOC. Okay, so we can do the advertising and marketing and then we have the quality as well as some technical points. So these are related to the laboratory recordings. Okay, I will show you just to give an example. I will uh, log into my Smart P3 now and I will show you a MOOC, how it actually looks and how it's depleted, how it's deployed. Okay, so we have, of course, uh, show you a MOOC. Okay, this is a MOOC actually, it's called Introduction to Virus Management Module 1. And this is actually a MOOC which has all the content here. So this is the lectures. So there is lecture as a video lecture on YouTube and a quiz, another lecture, another lecture and so on and so forth. Students watch all and they do assessment, which is the quiz. And they have to finish all the assessment before the course is declared as complete and they can be certified. So now this is actually an ongoing MOC. We leave it on. So when students complete it, they will come in, complete it. Then the, I go and check the grade book for completion and issue the certificate based on the uh, completion of the MOC. So you can have a similar kind of a setup for your respective MOC using existing content okay, or new content which you create for the MOC. Okay, so that's about the MOC itself. Any questions? or the MOC.
Takene? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good Don't evening. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, my sincere apologies for just no, joining no. The, the, the session no, because I have no another worries, meeting. No worries. This, no uh, worries. Yes. Uh, something about MOOC. Uh, no, I, I just need a cl need clarification. When, you, mm. when we talk about MOOC, mm. right, yeah. uh, must it be uh, a duplicate of uh, an existing course offered in PPIB or is it basically just any course that we can develop basically as a standalone course just uh, for the purpose of, you know, uh, uh, added value to our students or maybe it can eventually be a, a micro credential course itself? Uh, what, what is the policy like when it comes to uh, developing MOOC in UMS? It, must it be basically an alternative uh, course, which is a replica of an existing course that we have? Yeah, thank you, Prof. Actually, I'll answer this in terms of the relative. Yeah, in terms of the relative, uh, in the in terms of the relative uh, relativity, it's basically uh, relativity, relativity of the relativity Can you hear me, Prof? Yes, my... yes, yes. Okay, okay, yes, I can. Okay. So let me answer sure. the question. Okay, so first thing, the first question is, uh, what what is the purpose of the MOOC? Actually, there are uh, multiple uses of the MOOC. One is the MOOC as a source for income generation. So. In this case, the MOOC may not have to be related to the subject matter at all. It may be a certain subject matter expert who creates a MOOC for public consumption. The second one will be related to the what you mentioned earlier. It can be a subset of a larger course. If it's a subset of a larger course, it can be used as part That's of a course. credit transfer program. For example, if your 14-week course has three uh, CLOs, the MOOC can cover only one CLO, and, but you can incorporate it into your larger uh, program. The other one is, of course, I would suggest to you is always micro credential. Design the MOOC so that it can be converted into a micro credential because this will actually save you a lot of the paperwork later on. So if you have an existing MOOC and you want to convert it into micro credential, it becomes more difficult if you don't have an uh, existing have, uh, basis for it. Basis for it. So I would suggest that you no, suggest use it as uh, uh, any of these three formats. Properly. Okay, and now, uh, when it comes to KPI, right? Our KRA one, there, there, there are KPI. There is a KPI for MOOC for every yeah. faculty, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm not sure whether we have understood it correctly before. Uh, whereby, the, uh, when it, it when it comes to meeting the fulfill uh, uh fulfilling the MOOC KPI, uh, uh, the under the initial understanding was that we need to develop. Uh, MOOC courses, which are based on existing courses, uh, meaning courses that uh, we offer in PPIB. For instance, my course. Yeah, if uh, uh, PPIB uh, opt to uh, use my course to develop or uh, to uh, transfer, uh, transform it into a MOOC, uh, MOOC, MOOC, uh, MOOC course, basically. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that is basically what we are, we are supposed to do to uh, transform form my particular course using the MOOC template in order to come up with the MOOC to fulfill the uh, KRA. Uh, is, is that what we are practicing? Is that what is expected of us? Or is it that uh, we have actually misunderstood it? Uh, actually, we can come up with any uh, any MOOC course which can be a subset of whatever course that we are we are offering, or we can even come up with a brand new uh, subject matter uh, uh, a MOOC course based on a brand new subject matter and ultimately still meet that particular KPI that we are talking about. You're correct, Prof. It actually can be any other course related to, because when the KPT and the MQ, MQA come for their taklima, they say that the, they will encourage the development of market-driven MOOCs. So, these are, so what they mean is that they can be part of the uh, public, what, what is known as the, the ones which have a lot of public appeal for the MOOC. But having said that, it's perfectly okay to align the MOOC to your existing core course. The, for example, you have a course code and then you align, but that MOOC will be a subset of the original course. So it can be utilized for credit transfer as well, Prof. That was the I origin see, right. that, that, of it. Thank you very much. I think this is this this uh, you have helped to clarify something which I think we are all not very clear. You know, yeah. the reason why I'm asking you is because we have not been able to fulfill that particular KPI. And of course, uh, as early as 2020, that's when it all started where 
all the faculties, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, all the so-called FIPAs were asked to uh, recommend uh, two or uh, a minimum of two courses to be transformed into MOOC courses, correct? Yes, so but... the understanding back then was that, okay, which would be the, the most suitable courses offered in PPIB, which can uh, be transformed into MOOC, right? So therefore, PPIB suggested four, and we send uh, our lecturers uh, yeah. to go for all this briefing and training. And somehow or other, uh, apparently, uh, uh, we have not been able to transform and uh, and basically create these MOOC courses because, uh, uh, I mean, the report was that it, it, it is quite tedious. It, it was very difficult. So I, I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, we, we have actually got it right uh, because, of course, if it is about transforming an existing course, a 14-week long course, into mm. MOOC, you know, definitely it will be very difficult, correct? But, yes, that's uh, correct. When you are saying that, now what you're saying is that it can only be, it can actually be a subset of one of those courses. Yes. Then that would yeah. be yeah. actually quite easy to develop, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that, that's why we had actually offered lecturers offered all lecturers. these solutions for them. One is, for example, here, yeah, 14 weeks, you're going to record them anyway. So pick up four weeks, the first four weeks, and then you just convert those into MOC. It technically is an MOC because those four weeks will probably cover up once yellow. So in terms of the technicality, it is an MOC. I see. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now I, I we are clear, and uh, we shouldn't not, we shouldn't be delaying right in 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 uh, I mean having our MOOC courses since it is not actually as difficult as we first thought. Yes, Prof. Yeah. Actually, what I did, right? I did a, I did an experiment on on how to develop the MOOC. So I develop a MOOC from scratch, it means from de novo, like from the beginning. The problem with this kind of development is that it's too tedious and time consuming. So I would suggest to you the best option is to pick four lectures from the content and then convert four to five weeks and then convert those four to five weeks or four to five topics into a MOOC. That's it. All right. Thank you so much for clarification. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions related to MOOC? Prof. Kenneth, can I just yeah, ask? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. About MOOC? Yeah, please. Right. Let's say uh, there are fourteen weeks, right, and you have got three uh, MOOCs, right? Uh, one MOOC for Prof. five weeks, another one for another five weeks, and the last one for the four weeks. So after yeah. you have completed three MOOCs, all right, uh, yeah. is it possible for the lecturer not to uh, teach, um, at, uh, you know, in face-to-face um, -face online uh, sessions anymore, right, when the, the MOOC, right, with all the video and all the activities included with the three MOOCs? Yeah. yeah, is that Prof. Jason? Because I cannot see uh, the. It's Prof. Jason, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. Very much. Thank you. I just, uh, okay. Is it so, possible that uh, you don't if you don't meet with them if you have got uh, let's say one MOOC and then uh, you, you teach, let's say online, right? For yeah. the other sessions, I think yeah. it is understandable. But mm. if you have got three MOOCs for all the fourteen weeks, so is yeah. it can it be accepted? All right, uh, yeah. will the university allow? Um, that kind of arrangement when you all your three MOOCs replace uh, the yeah. sessions. I will explain uh, that prof with the example. For example, this is, for example these four lectures. If I, uh, I'm showing you this one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, and six. Okay, these six lectures, for instance, in the case in this particular case, they cover up three weeks of the instruction of fourteen weeks. So I can actually conduct. 11 weeks of instruction with the basic things and then I just add these components into the MOOC. So they will actually add up to the SLT student learning time. That's and once that is achieved, basically we have achieved the same objective. So I will tell my students, for instance, attend the first 11 weeks of this particular course and for the remaining three weeks, access the MOOC content. So that means uh, after week 11, 12, 13 and 14 will be links to this. So there'll be a re repost link. So they go here, they complete this, and they have actually completed the whole course because they completed the CLO. So this is an example of how we create a subset, and then it's perfectly uh, acceptable to the uh, learning management system, provided you have the uh, uh, the student learning time recorded in that particular system, Prof. All right, that means the MOOC 
only constitutes a part, right? Yeah, it's uh, only probably a, a third or maybe a quarter of the whole course, right? Yes, Prof, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question has to do with uh, the micro credentials. That's something very new to us. Okay. Right. Uh, you mentioned something, but, but we know that micro credentials probably will contribute to the, stu the credit hours that students get. So yeah. if it is converted into a uh, micro credential, uh, does the lecturer have to apply for uh, the university's permission, all right, um, or approval, yeah. so that uh, it, it is properly considered as a uh, a part, right, of the course that mm -hmm. carries uh, uh, certain credit hours. Okay, for this one, right? So this actually micro credential does not come under the domain of uh, Center for E-Learning, but I will just answer that for you based on what I have received information from the MK. The micro credential requires a different set of the paperwork, so it it will be like a normal course. We still have to register it, and we probably have to pay a fee. So that is done by the. Uh, Pusat for the quality, the quality, the the uh, I I don't have the exact name, but they are the one who look after the micro credential. So that means we have to submit by paperwork. For example, I have uh, my colleagues and I are developing some micro credential. We have to submit the entire set of tables to the Pusat to get the um, approval and reach the next stage. Okay, Prof. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. It's an entirely new set, so we have to actually pay. If we do a micro credential, we have to actually pay the MQA the fee, just as we do for the other courses. Prof. Oh, the university will pay for that particular. Yes, course. yes, yes. Yeah, we you. have to pay for that. Thank you, Prof. Thanks. Afternoon, Prof. I'm Emily. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Sure, sure, sure. Adeline. Yeah, I'm related to micro credential. I think the micro credential, just to answer Dr. Jason first, huh, is under CQA, which we have to submit a form to inform them we want to do the micro credential. However, I'm quite concerned with how this micro credential is being, uh, mm. uh, uh, how to say, uh, how we have to plan it. Do we plan it using something similar to what, how we plan for MOOC? And then uh, is the micro credential programs using the MOOC as the platform for uh, getting touch with the student? These are the two questions that I'm quite concerned with. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Dr. Allen. Actually, I cannot uh, address that issue because the, actually even I have submitted a micro credential uh, form format for that. Now, for micro credential, we had to submit similar to the synopsis. I'm trying to look in my email, but I don't cannot find it over here. Okay, so I will show you something. I can just show you from our. It's actually from I can only show you. So I had to actually submit a micro credential statement here. This I'll just show you this one. Okay, so it's a full statement and it contains all the content and it's like almost like a course synopsis. I don't have the full. Uh, I cannot give you immediately because I have the. Um, one second. Okay. If you need this, I can pass it to you. This we got from the Pusat early. Uh, okay, so this is we need to submit a form. Like, can you see this, uh, Doctor? Sharing my yes, screen. Yes, yes. This is okay. the MMS. Yeah, uh, I remember. This is the MMS. one. This is the one which we need to submit. Now I have submitted this almost four or five months ago, but I have not received any information for this. So this contains basic. The documentation, can you see this has a course code, the credit value, and so on and so forth. I mean, then yeah, it has actually, all the uh, courses in PPIP also submitted the same thing a few months ago, yeah. also. Yeah, so we don't receive anything after that. Yeah, that's I have the... not received that's why I'm waiting for my uh, for my because we have already created content, so we are waiting for that. But I cannot answer that because it's not under a portfolio, I can only share what I have uh, actually done. Thank you, Doctor. So sorry, Prof. It means yeah. that uh, the micro credential is not using MOOC as the platform as well. They are not using MOOC. N no, no. I, I, yeah, actually, I will explain to you. The, the same platform, uh, The same platform like the MOOC. Actually, the MOOC actually means you know what the actual meaning of MOOC is the massive open online courses. So the first yeah. the criteria is it should be open. Open meaning everyone can access it. You only have to pay for the certification, and it should be online. So that was the. 
So now whatever comes under that, like for example, the short term courses, long term courses, micro credential, they are all actually MOOCs. But it's only that the micro credential is a certified MOOC, which means you get a certificate with a credit transfer and so on and so forth. Whereas a normal MOOC is can be taken by any member of the public and as part of the learning process or as a student as part of another course subset. Okay, doctor. Yeah, thank answer? you, Prof. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I know it's it requires because we also are trying to figure out what is that micro credential, and uh, that's why we recommend to everyone to align the MOOC to micro credential. So later on, it's easier for you to transition into that rather than having a MOOC as standalone and then difficult to transition into a micro credential. Any other question, Puan Arna? I cannot see the question sometime. Um, no more in chat box for now. <laughs> Kennedy has said something about Microsoft Stream, right? Are you all use so you all can you all see the Microsoft Stream? Uh, have, and all you all using uh, Microsoft Stream? Okay. Dr. Adelina says, is this going to be uh, the same platform? Yeah, micro-credential will be using the, basically the same platform as LMS. So we use the same Smart V3 for micro-credential. There's no harm in that. So for the MOOC, we'll have to do an entire training for, uh, for setup. Okay, that will be face to face. Okay. So I'm going to upload. So you can actually find all your content, right? Which I have uh, covered now is actually included in that course which you enrolled into. So I will upload the last one, which is the uh, the course, uh, the MOOC thing inside the MOOC part inside the. Okay. So are there any other question related to the? Just upload the last. So I'll upload the lecture here, so so you can have access to that MOOC. Dr. Kenneth, I think yeah, um, yeah. Dr. Adeline requested to have the um, slides for, I think. Yeah, I, I will upload them now only. I'm doing Absolutely. it now. Yeah. So for the MOOC, right? Okay, I, I upload them in the system so everyone can access it and no problem at all to access. Others, if I share a link, sometime it will have problem. Uh, excuse me, uh, doctor. Uh, yeah, prof, yeah. Uh, do you mind if you share the recording with us later on? No, and no worries then... at all. The, the recording is for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You. I, I'd like to share with all my colleagues who, who sure, missed sure. the the talk today. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. It's no the pro, the recording will be distributed. We always give it away after the uh, session is over. Okay. So I'm going to save and display. Okay, so you can get all the content here. So if um, I think I make uh, Dr. Uh, uh, one Adna, I can make you a teacher. So maybe um, Nora, you can make uh, one Adna teacher so she can upload the recording also here. Okay, just convert her to teacher. Uh, yeah, Adna, I think you assign her as teacher, and then you can. So you can upload one or no, you can upload your your content here. Your which is the the teacher. Okay, manager. Okay, already manager. So you can upload the content in the system. 
the video recording file. Uh, sure. Sure. Okay, so, so all you do is upload it here. Otherwise, they have problem chasing the link, right? Because sometimes the link is sent by email. So I think just make one category here and add an activity or resource and upload the WebEx, if you don't mind, in the system. So you're recording at your terminal, right? WebEx? Oh, Nora is recording. There's yeah, the yeah, recording the host. Yes. Okay, so then you can upload. Okay, so if there are any, no questions, uh, Juan, Eugenia, I want to say anything? Uh, I have, I, I have nothing to add. Okay. Um, but if, um, I think a lot of them, they haven't taken a look at the template of the MOOC. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to go here, go into the MOOC thing, right, here. Okay, this is a PDF lecture note and just scroll down to one place. There's a link there with template. It's here somewhere down here. So it's here. And there's a process there. I've given you the process and you click here. The course template is available here. You mouse over this, right? You'll get a link. If you're logged into UMS uh, on Gmail, you will see the link here. So you click here and then it'll take you directly to the link. Okay, this is the link. Show you here. Okay, this is the course template link. Okay, you download it, you convert to a word and you can use. This is the course structure, the content is all over here. So it's not like table four, it's it's relatively simple. So you just have week one, week two, week three, week four, and week five. You can add here and then your content, activity, and assessment. It's as simple as that. Okay. Okay, um, I have something to add. Um, if anybody from PPIB who, who is interested to actually create uh, their own MOOC, okay, um, I hope that everybody is in the know that um, the MOOC is currently for our UMS only for now because uh, we haven't have any platform to have it open with the public yet. So, um, if you are interested to set up a MOOC um, for four weeks or five weeks, you can just um, send a soft copy to Erna. Erna will email it to PEP, and then from there, um, we will help you to process the um, with the two reviewers that you have um, named. Okay, so we can handle all the black and white paper for you guys. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I think that's it from me. Yeah. Thank you, Juan Eugenia. So if we have no further question, we can end the session now. Thank you so, to, so much to all the participants. Thank you for your participation. And thank you very much to Juan Adna for organizing this event. And thank you for the PPIB for inviting us over to deliver this uh, roadshow. Thank you very much. And if yeah, you need you. you need a picture, Ambar. <laughs> I just <laughs> if you want thank to very much, uh, Dr. Kenneth. Thank yeah. you very much, uh, Eugenia and everyone, yeah, uh, for uh, having this uh, very, very enlightening and informative roadshow. Now we are clearer, definitely. Yes. Hopefully we'll be able to deliver uh, the MOOC KPIs by this year. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. If you need help, you can ask us. We will show you how to do the editing on all those. For example, lecturers have pre-recorded videos. We can guide you to edit. Uh, yeah. Maybe you. we can turn on our camera and uh, we will have a Photoshop session. Okay, please look at your own webcam. Uh, one, two, three. Okay, again, uh, there is uh, still... Uh, People with uh, coming. Okay, again, uh, one last time. One, yeah, two, one three. One last time. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Have a good weekend. Bye bye. Thank you.